Hello, everyone. My name is Humberto Moro, and I'm adjunct curator of SCAD exhibitions at the SCAD Museum of Art. And I'm very happy to welcome you to this conversation with our Define Art 2021 honoree conceptual artist Sanford Biggers. His exhibition, Contradiction, here at the Walter O. Evans Center for African American Studies, is a solo show which reviews his production from 2006 to 2020 with almost 20 works in an astonishingly diverse mediums like installations, videos, quilts, marble, bronze, feathers, among others. Sanford was born in 1970 and he was raised in Los Angeles, currently lives and works in New York City. And his work is an interplay of narrative, of perspective and history that speaks to current social, political, and economic happenings while also examining the context that bore them. He was awarded the 2017 Rome Prize in Visual Arts, and he has had solo exhibitions at the Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis, at the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit, at the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art, and the Brooklyn Museum, among others. He has been the recipient of many awards and honors, amongst them the 2017 Rome Prize in Visual Arts, and he was inducted in the Hall of Fame of the New York Foundation for the Arts in New York. And most recently, which is very exciting, he has been appointed president of the board at the Sculptor Center in New York. Um, Sanford, thank you so much for honoring the SCAD community with your presence. And I want to start this conversation by asking you if you can share a little bit of your background. How did art uh, get to you or how did you got to art? Um, yeah, so, you know, art happened in a few different ways, but I think the really pivotal two things that happened were, um, uh, I grew up in Los Angeles and I was a practitioner in all of the, uh, B-boy and B-girl arts. So rapping, uh, DJing, doing graffiti, break dancing, and so on. And <clears throat> as part of that, I was doing graffiti on the streets of LA, you know, where I'd sneak out of my parents' house and bomb the walls and the alleys and the train yards and so on. And um, at one point I got busted and I was very fortunate that they didn't, you know, the um, where I got caught um, doing a mural, they didn't press charges. Um, they just put the fear of God in me and my parents did the rest. <laughs> and around a week later, I was uh, urged to apply to the AP arts program at my high school and um, that's where I started to formally start to learn art. So in that AP class, I started with oil painting, strangely enough. And <clears throat> that was uh, one of the events. And the second one is um, I grew up taking piano lessons for a couple of years, like two years maybe. And they were teaching only classical and I literally hated it. So um, I quit lessons, but my brother had a garage band and he and his friends would be playing all the time. So I started to try to play what they were playing. And then later I started to just listen to the radio for hours and try to pick up tunes and train my ear so that I could, you know, play by ear. And um, that worked well for a while. And then when I started to listen to jazz somewhere in my probably 13, 14, I started to listen to my parents' records and I couldn't keep up. Um, <clears throat> it actually might've been closer to 12, 13 and I just couldn't keep up. I couldn't follow what was going on. So I started painting portraits of the people I was listening to. So Miles Davis and Thelonious Monk and Mahalia Jackson, Aretha Franklin and so on. And then that led to political figures that I was also learning about, um, not at school because school wasn't teaching about a lot of the black political leaders, but in my home and in my community, I was learning about them and sharing that information when I would take it to school. And people would say, who is that person? And I'd be able to tell them a little bit more about, you know, maybe Jesse Jackson or uh, Medgar Evers or so on. Now, thinking about your production as a as an artist, um, um, you sort of like advocate for this idea of open endedness, and also just thinking about the amazing quantity of references you have. You know, like from um, European art history or Japanese culture, or um, also your spiritual practice is such an integral part of your production, um, and um. You know, like at the same time, you're very precise. So I wonder if you can speak a little bit about being precise and, 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 and having a very powerful discourse 
at the same time that you keep things open ended and and sort of like fluctuating. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'm not really a big fan of categories in general <clears throat> and titles. Um, I find that they're limiting and they impose restrictions. And it's usually to serve some type of indexical or even financial means. So um, I, when I look at European work or pre-Columbian or Japanese or Kenyan, I don't differentiate. I just like what I respond to. And the way my mind works, I actually start to say, oh, that reminds me of this thing that I might have seen in Padua. This reminds me of what I might have seen in Kyoto. And I start to put those narratives together. And then I go a step further. And then I start to literally research some of that stuff. And I found a lot of the time that there's impulses, artistic impulses and creative impulses that transcend borders. And they're more um, fundamental and, and universal than they are specific. So um, I take some uh, liberties with that. Um, I also think deference, I'm very deferential to the references that I um, borrow from and use. Um, I like to know as much as I can about them. And I rarely use things for shock. I mean, shock might happen here and there, but it's usually not orchestrated to solely be shock. Um, if anything, it's a means to an end. But in any of my works from any period in, in any genre, you can pretty much uh, assume that there are layers of references and research that go into it. So what you get on the surface first read, it might not be what you get after spending three, five, 10 minutes with it and might be totally different than that person standing right next to you. And at that point, it becomes more reflexive because it's about what those individuals bring to the work in terms of visual, visual and historical literacy and sort of personal positioning. Now, um, I want to focus specifically on um, your work with quilts, uh, some of which are present in this show. Um, we are now seeing one in your background, uh, Chappelle and Logic from 2017. Um, and I want to, you have said before that you use uh, history as a material. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can speak about that idea and on a sort of like second part of this question, um, talk about the significance of quilts in um, the Underground Railroad and that in relationship to the museum also being um, um, sort of like nested in a former uh, railroad depot? Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, I've always, I don't know if I've always considered history to be malleable, but I would say in the last decade or so, um, that notion really has become very strong um, in my thinking. And it's largely because in studying, um, you know, history and ethnography and so on, that there's these moments and these um, assertions that come from, you know, European academic texts. And there are texts from other countries that totally contradict that reading. And it's not necessarily just an instance of history being claimed and narrated by the quote unquote victor, they might be totally just making their own assumptions. And most of the time, not doing the research to see that the people who live with this work and make this work actually do have a story and history about it that is totally contradictory to the one that they're assuming. So in that respect, I look at history as being malleable. Um, another example is how we find every few years that there's something that we took for granted and thought as quote unquote fact for you know decades or generations and then find out that in fact it wasn't. Um, and new discoveries happen all the time that debunk old truths. So um, in that respect, I started to consider history itself malle and malleable material. And um, you know, I do like that idea that if history is written by the victors, then what does that mean for today when history is actually open source? Um, and that's how I approach it. Um, and when it comes to the quilts and the Underground Railroad, I was doing a project in Philadelphia many years ago, and I initially started to, I wanted to do an installation based on stained glass windows. But when I started to survey the um, place where I was doing the installation, the Mother Bethel Church in Philadelphia, um, which coincidentally is the first, uh, the longest black owned piece of real estate of record, and also was a stop on the a station on the Underground Railroad. Um, they had a very small quilt exhibition in their basement. And 
I started to get more feelings from those quilts than I was from the stained glass that they had um, upstairs in the church itself. And I went to another location, I think it might have been at Temple, that coincidentally also had an exhibition of quilts. And that's where I started to learn about the, um, you know, the idea that quilts were used on the Underground Railroad as signposts, coded language, coded signs that um, would be outside of safe houses. So if a certain pattern or a certain fold was visible, then escaping enslaved people could read that code and either get directions on where to go or um, instructions that they can't stay at the safe house because it's under surveillance or that they can stay at the safe house. And even the names of the quilts like follow the drunkard's path and the gourd and the North Star and all of these names that you associate with quilt names are also were considered to be directions as well. Follow the drunkard's path up the North towards the North Star. Um, and whether this really happened or not, I find it to be poignant. And the fact that it is um, persisted as a vernacular history this long was really the impetus to making a body of work based on it. So I consider myself a late collaborator with the original quilt makers themselves, because many of the quilts I get are pre-1900. Um, and they were often made by groups of people, groups of women, um, uh, but sometimes men as well, sometimes individuals, but often the quilts I find are in disrepair or in somebody's attic, or they're sometimes gifted to me. And so they're out of circulation to a degree. And once I get them, uh, and I do my interventions on them, I start to literally consider myself a late collaborator with that original maker. And what's more important to me than reading these quilts now is how they may be perceived and read in the future, because ultimately they become this sort of cross-generational palimpsest of American experience. Is, that, is, is this what you mean when you say future ethnographies? Absolutely, absolutely. And I use that as, um, you know, because uh, a lot of my work is also influenced by ethnographic study and, you know, uh, museological studies of various primordial primary culture, cultures, um, Indo, um, various Asian countries, pre-Columbian, African, so on. And <clears throat> use, looking at that language of the power object and ritual practice and charging these objects has really been a guiding force into how I approach the figure and sculptural objects and so on. So again, this, it means one thing to see them today, but what will they mean when seen in the future and compared to the histories that they come from? Now, um, moving towards um, the center space of the gallery in which we have a video room that has a program of videos that you have done in different years. Um, I, wanna, I want you to speak a little bit about the trilogy um, that you did between 2009 and 2016 with three pieces, shuffle, shatter, and shake. Um, if you can talk a little bit about those uh, pieces. Um, yeah, so um, I set out you know, over a decade ago oh. to create some you know, loosely nonlinear narrative video works that The, the way they would really occur is I was doing residencies and living abroad and in various, um, you know, residencies and, and studio um, areas where I was working in studios. And I wanted to do something to document those relationships that I formed, document those places, and then to later form into some type of narrative. And uh, the first one starts in Stuttgart, Germany. And the main character is a gentleman named Ricardo. It's a Brazilian guy who I met on a bus. And we became very good friends. And uh, we made the first video in Stuttgart and I was invited to do a project in Salvador de Bahia a few years later. And I thought it would have been, be incredible to bring Ricardo back to Brazil where he had not been in like 25 years. So I reprised the, reprised the character that we established with the first film. And then we went to Brazil and then made a second one. And it's really stream of conscious, improvisational to a degree video, uh, pieces that are costume and soundtrack and so on. But um, my idea was that ultimately somehow they would form some type of origin story. Origin story of what? I have no idea, but an origin story. Maybe it's the origin of origins. Um, and then a few years later, I was invited to do a project in Ethiopia. And I 
thought that Northern Ethiopia would be the perfect place because of the Danakil depression and the landscape there and the visuals to sort of, um, you know, make the finale, the final um, episode of that three piece suite of video of films. So we shot that um, uh, and I think it was in 2015 or 16, I'm forgetting the year right now. Um, and I've shown different versions of it at different times. I might have shown one video sometime. I, I did a remix of three, the three different suites in Detroit a few years ago. And for this particular show, it's another iteration using all three of those pieces and even works that have derived from that project. And interestingly enough, I did jokingly call it an origin story, but somehow in my mind, those, this video becomes an origin story for the objects that you're seeing in the show. And we also have Moon Rising um, as part of the program of the video room, which is a piece that you have done with um, Moon Medicine, your experimental band. Can you talk a little bit about the band and how that interacts with your practice as a solo artist? Um, yeah, so um, I did mention that, you know, my beginnings as a creator were, you know, from the musical standpoint. And consequently, throughout my career, I, you know, when I started showing in New York and being invited to do projects, I started to expand my practice to involve performance. Although I personally don't really like to think of it as performance, I think it more as activations, activations of spaces, activations of objects, activations of audiences, because, um, uh, the band that I put together, um, our performances are usually not the typical, you know, we perform on a stage and there's an audience watching us. Often we're breaking the fourth wall, we're going into the audience, the audience is coming on stage, so that everyone is part of this, part of the jam, basically. And um, the origins of the, the specific group started in 2007 with the performance um, Biennale, um, Biennial uh, uh, Performa in New York. And I did a piece called The Something Sweet, where I assembled a bunch of uh, musicians and writers and singer songwriters that I've done stuff with over the years. And we did a full out costumed um, hour long performance. And it was fantastic. One night only, two shows. Lou Reed was in the audience, um, Jay Electronica, Erica Badu, um, Lori Anderson. Uh, it, was, it was wild. It was at a place called The Box that's in the Bowery in New York City. And it was right when The Box opened. So it was before people even knew about it. And it's already an underground club to begin with. So it really sort of created a mystique about the show. <clears throat> After that, I was invited to do a, a series of different performances over the years. And I reprised the group. And now the core group really consists of uh, Jahi Sundance Lake, who is uh, sort of the DJ and one of the producers of the music. Um, he also is part of Robert Glasper's group and Michelle and Dago Cello's group. Um, Martin Luther, who is uh, the main singer and guitarist, who's part of the Roots. Um, uh, Andre Simone, who is Prince's original bass player and played bass on the first three albums. And Mark Hines, who does a lot of the technology work and he is a second bassist. And um, Swiss Chris is one of the drummers that we use and, you know, the players change from time to time as necessary. And we do a lot of collaborations, like we've done work with Michelle and Dave Ocello. Uh, we're doing a project now with Feral Monch, the MC from uh, Organized Confusion, um, and the list goes on. So um, <clears throat> for me personally, it's a way of taking my practice and making it less really about what I'm doing in the studio. And I consider myself a director, you know, like a musical director in the sense that I'm putting these elements, these instruments, these voices, and these players together. But once that happens, then I sit back and I'm just a piano player. I'm the keyboardist of the group. So I let all of that stuff evolve. And my contribution is less standing in front of the group and telling them what to do, but more saying, let's do a version of this and see where it goes. And let's put in some of this video content and see how we can remix it. And then, you know, through technology, we're actually programming some video clips through the instrument. So if I hit a certain chord, you'll see a certain visual. So there's improvisational moments happening within that. So it's a, a very free form way of working. It's very gratifying for me. Um, and it's really good for the musicians too, because it allows them to perform in a way where they aren't beholden to the personas that they have to perform when they you know, do things under their own name. 
Now, um, the last group of work that I want to speak um, regarding uh, contradiction, your exhibition at the Scott Museum of Art, is the BAM series. Um, we have sort of like three iterations of um, that project uh, in the gallery. Um, so if you can tell us a little bit how that project originated and maybe talk uh, about uh, BAM for um, Mark, Michael that we have on view and Mike for Tamir and um, Infinite Tabernacle, which is a, a video installation that relates to this series. Sure. Well, um, you know, the series really comes as a reaction, basically. And it was reaction, you know, much like everybody else. We've been watching for the last several years incidences of uh, Black people being killed by the police. And by no means is this a new phenomenon. I grew up knowing about this, obviously. And, well, the country's been doing it for 400 years, so everybody should know that this is happening. But until we really had the video documentation, it was very easy to brush it under the, uh, under the rug and say, oh, either that's your problem or you're exaggerating. But now we know that you know, these things are happening far more frequently than I think anyone really wants to admit. And I found myself one morning in Berlin waking up, looking at my phone, and yet another uh, individual had been killed. In this case, it was Michael Brown. And it was a knee-jerk reaction. Um, I wrote in a sketchbook what I wanted to do. And basically it was, um, you know, over the last several years, I've been uh, collecting African figures um, that I would find at various places. Sometimes I would go, you know, some I found it literally in um, Ghana or Senegal or South Africa. Some I might have found in Baltimore, Maryland at a thrift shop. So they come from all places, but I would collect them and have them in my studio sort of as inspiration. Um, I only used one in a piece one time years ago. But other than that, they're references to me. And then when this happened, I thought, you know, the pain that I'm feeling reading this right now and, and learning about Michael Brown, what is the best way? What is a way for me to communicate that through art? And I, at that point, made the decision to take some of those objects and make them into the work itself, which was a very hard thing to do because I have a personal attachment to them. But um, what I wound up doing was taking them and dipping them in wax. And there was two reasons for that. I wanted to obscure them because there is the belief that things that you can't see are actually the most powerful. And the second reason is because often when you read these reports, the description comes in, you've got a six foot black male wearing a hoodie and jeans. Okay, well, if you live in Harlem, that's pretty much everybody. So, you know, there's that vulnerability, that sense of vulnerability and that excuse like they all look the same. So um, I started to dip them in wax to get rid of their unique qualities also. And then um, I would take them to a shooting range and using different caliber weapons, start to sculpt them. So shooting them with a 22 um, or a 12 gauge shotgun or um, a Glock 9. So different guns leave different marks, different bullets affect these figures in different ways. And through that, um, I started to sculpt them. Um, I personally don't pull the trigger. Um, partly because it is really just such hard work to deal with on a personal level that I couldn't pull the triggers. Um, and maybe it's sort of the same as the moon medicine situation where I direct things to a degree and then I let them form themselves. So I have somebody else pull the trigger and then we take the remnants and we cast them in bronze. So uh, for Michael, which is in the show, um, is probably the largest one that I've done. And uh, obviously it's from Michael Brown and, you know, I think this goes into my approach to making work. Um, I did feel very protective of where I showed that, that work um, because I literally wanted to have some type of communication with his family, with his mother, um, to let her know that the work was out there so that it wouldn't blindside her when she saw it or heard about it. And luckily that opportunity came and I received her blessings. Um, and beyond that, um, a large version of for Michael is the final piece that you see as you're leaving Brian Stevenson's Equal Justice Initiative Legacy Museum in uh, Montgomery, Alabama. And that museum is dedicated to um, the, the Black experience in America from you know, the standpoint of abduction from Africa all the way through civil rights and slavery and reconstruction and Jim Crow, all the way to the prison industrial complex. So in that context, it's really talking to and talking about the conditions that that museum is dedicated to. So, you know, 
I often refer to my works as power objects, but when they're in a context like that, that's when they're at their most powerful. Well, thank you so much, Sanford, for um, talking to us. It has been an absolute pleasure to hear from you uh, about your exhibition at the Scott Museum of Art. Thank you everyone for listening to our gallery talk. Uh, please tune in tomorrow evening as Sanford is going to deliver his Define keynote lecture, followed by a Q&A with Scott students. Uh, but right now, join Scott curator DJ Hellerman and artist Emily Fuhr for a conversation about her exhibition, Startup. DJ, take it away. <laughs>